I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. How do you come up with all the questions you come up with? Your book is filled with more questions and solutions. Well, you know, when I watch science fiction movies, I say to myself, what in this movie violated the laws of physics? When I see Harry Potter, in fact, that's, of course, a movie about magic. But I realize that, well, very few laws of physics are violated, even in Harry Potter. Once we understand the motion of molecules that can manipulate molecules, we can do things that most people would consider magic. And so, writing this book, I ask the same question. What prevents us from laser pointing? What prevents us from living nearly forever? What prevents us from going to the stars? And then I realize, almost nothing. The laws of physics are compatible with everything inside that book. And then every time you come up with a solution, though, it seems like you're looking at, what questions does this lead to? When you put it that way, you begin to realize that every proposition in science fiction, you can pick apart. Every question has another answer, which begs more questions. But that's good, because that's what science is all about. I am so happy to have super physicist Michio Kaiku. And I just read your book, The Future of Humanity. Uh, it just came out. In fact, you just told me it made the New York Times bestseller list. That's right. Congratulations. On the surface, it seems to be about what's all the technology needed to get from here to Mars. But then it dives into so much more, which is basically all the different ways we can maybe fly to other solar systems, even other galaxies. And you even get into how the mind and the body and our consciousness expand to basically save humanity across every type of interstellar disaster that could happen in the future. So it's just it's just fascinating. The information you give, that's fascinating, of course, too. But the questions you ask, and I want to explore that even more. You're obviously one of the most famous physicists out there. You have 600,000 Twitter followers, 3 million Facebook followers. You're a correspondent on the CBS morning shows. You've been all over the place. I also liked your book, Physics of the Impossible. Uh, you wrote uh, Physics of the Future, The Future of the Mind, Einstein's Cosmos, Beyond Einstein. So many books. Uh, clearly, you just have fun with this. <laughs> wow. After such a great introduction, I can't wait to meet this person myself. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> We're in a stand-up club, so. <laughs> okay. I was reading when you were in high school, you were trying to like form antimatter in your garage. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was successful. I went to the National Science Fair, took gorgeous photographs of antimatter, and I built an atom smasher. The goal was to actually create a beam of antimatter in my mom's garage. 
Uh, what and I did, did do was I blew everyone? out every circuit breaker in the house, of course. <laughs> And how how would you just out of curiosity? How would someone go about making antimatter right now? <laughs> well, uh, this is an advice I give to high school kids. You can get sodium twenty two, which is radioactive. <clears throat> it naturally emits uh, positrons or anti electrons. You put it in a cloud chamber, and then you put it in a magnetic field. Uh, my magnetic field is about six hundred gauss. That's about one thousand times the Earth's magnetic field. And antimatter bends the wrong way in a magnetic field. That's how you know that it's antimatter, and it won the attention of an atomic scientist who changed my life. His name was Edward Teller, father of the hydrogen bomb, and he got me a scholarship to Harvard, and uh, I became a physicist. So it's kind of, you're kind of one of those interesting people. Like a lot of people, they start off one career, and they say, you know what, this is not for me, and then they go full force into another career. But since you were a teenager, you've been... You know, you've put in your forty thousand hours of mastering physics, and have you ever been discouraged or dissuaded or thought about going? I mean, obviously, you've got into media, so that's that's uh, a piece some of your your creative interests. But have you ever really thought of like diving into any other career? Uh, no, because it all happened when I was eight years old, and that gave me a focus for the rest of my life. Everyone was talking about the fact that a great scientist had just died. And I'll never forget the picture they flashed on the evening news. It was a picture of his desk. And the caption simply said, this is the unfinished manuscript from the greatest scientist of our time. So I said to myself, why couldn't he finish it? What's so hard? It's a homework problem, right? Couldn't he ask his mother? I mean, what's so hard that a scientist could not finish it? I had to know. I was obsessed with this question. I went to the library. I found out the man was Albert Einstein. And that unfinished manuscript was the unified field theory, the theory of everything. He wanted an equation one inch long that would allow him to, quote, read the mind of God. And I said to myself, whoa, <laughs> that's for me. That's what I want to work on. And for the rest of my life, I've been working on that quest. In fact, today we think we have it. It's called string theory. I'm one of the founders of the subject. And uh, we think that that is the missing unified field theory, the theory of everything. There's even an Oscar film, uh, Oscar-nominated film called The Theory of Everything about this theory. And um, I, I don't want to ask you to explain string theory because after reading 27 books on the topic, I still don't really understand it. And I feel like with people like you and, and others that I've read, I feel like I should be able to understand it by this point because you're so... I could say in this book, The Future of Humanity, you're so good at explaining the most complicated concepts. I mean, you you even explain, you know, you explain quantum theory so well, you explain interstellar travel and all the challenges and so on. And then just string theory, the few pages you spend explaining string theory, I'm just reading it over and over again and trying to wrap my brain around it. I feel like there's always things that are so difficult you don't really you can't really explain because you have there's some level of difficulty that someone has to understand and understand the basics is my guess. Well, no, I think that if you understand the picture, the fundamental picture behind things, then things become simple. Mathematics is nothing but bookkeeping around this picture. This picture is basically a rubber band. Think of a rubber band that vibrates from a distance it looks like a dot. But from close up, you realize that it's nothing but different vibrations on the same rubber band. And how many vibrations are there? An infinite number of potential vibrations. And we give each one a name. One's an electron, one's a proton, a quark, a lepton, a yang mills particle, neutrino. So they're nothing but different musical notes on a vibrating rubber band. And then physics is nothing but the harmonies you can make on these vibrating rubber bands. Chemistry is the melodies you can play on these vibrating bands, rubber bands, when they bump into each other. The universe is a symphony of these. And the mind of God, the mind of God that Einstein spent 30 years of his life chasing after, the mind of God is cosmic music resonating through hyperspace. That is the mind of God. And so that, that's a beautiful explanation. And let me ask you this. Given, and let's say string theory is this unified uh, uh, equation that Einstein was searching for, what what can we do? What good does it do us? Like while, with Einstein's theory of relativity, we understand so much and we're able to do things with quantum mechanics, we're able to do things. What can we do if we really truly understand and can test what you just said? Well, the short answer is nothing. 
because we're talking about energy scales that would require a universe to create. You'd have to be a god to create a universe in the laboratory, but that's what string theory can do. It actually allows you to calculate what the energy is necessary to create a universe in your basement. And it also answers some of the deepest cosmic questions of philosophers. Time travel. Einstein's equations allow for time travel, but we don't know how stable the time machine is. String theory can answer that question. Wormholes. Alice in Wonderland was, had a gateway to Wonderland, a mirror. Well, that mirror is also a solution of string theory, but uh, Einstein's equations allow for wormholes. But again, they don't know whether Einstein's equations do not explain whether they're stable or not. String theory does. String theory also explains what happened before the Big Bang. Einstein simply says, boom, there was a bang, and voila, there's the universe. But what happened before the Big Bang? Well, Einstein's theory says the universe is a bubble of some sort. We live on the skin of the bubble. The bubble's expanding. That's called the Big Bang Theory. String theory says there are other bubbles out there in a bubble bath of universes. So we have a new paradigm shift from a universe, one world, to a multiverse, a bubble bath of universes. And when these universes collide with each other or they peel off and fission in half, that's the Big Bang. So let me ask you: Without string theory, can't we just say that would that also that that was a possibility within Einstein's theories no. that there were many Big Bangs all around? No, Einstein's theory only allows for one universe, just mm-hmm. one. And quantum While string mechanics theory as well? allows for a multiverse of universes. So, so I want to ask you a little bit more about all this. Um, a co- one thing that really fascinated me in your book, and I'm I'm skipping maybe three fourths of the way through. Uh, but and we'll go back and forth. But you know, you describe uh, one of the one of the sections in the book describes what would happen if we encounter in our own space travels other alien civilizations. That's right, a whole and, section of the book. And the odds are, given that the universe is almost fourteen billion years old, the odds are that these civilizations won't simply be the same age as our civilization. They'll right. probably be millions and millions of years older or, or whatever. Right. If, particularly if we're encountering them, it means they're sophisticated enough to encounter us. And so chances are millions of years is just a blip in the 14 billion years. Chances are they're so much more sophisticated than us, it's, we, we wouldn't even be able to fully comprehend them. That's but right. One thing that was very fascinating to me was that when you explored what these civilizations might be like, that it all comes from a point of weakness. And I'll explain what I mean. You, you basically say, why did we develop the ability to use our hands and to tell stories and so on? Is it because we were so weak relative to almost every other species around us that we had to, we had to solve more complicated problems in order to survive as a species? And so you make the conjecture, you expand that to what these other alien civilizations might be like, they must have started from some point of weakness as well in order to conquer their problems. And I found that to be, I never thought of it that way, that we're great in some sense because of how weak we are. That's right. We are the misfits of Mother Nature. Other animals have claws, talons, fur, they fly, much stronger than us. Uh, From an animal point of view, um, we're really a reject Uh, We don't run very fast. Uh, Our skin is very vulnerable to infections and to to tears. And uh, we can't can't do everything that uh, that the animals can do. And what makes us different? Precisely because we are the misfits of Mother Nature, it forces us to compensate. And the thing that we have going for us is the brain. Other than that, (laughs) we're a freak of nature. And so that's why the brain is so important because it is the only thing we have going for us. We don't have anything else going for us because we can't swim very fast, we can't fly, we can't uh, fight very well. Our vision is limited versus many other species. We, we can't smell uh, at all. Uh, we can barely hear. Uh, dogs have much better senses than us by far. But we have a brain. And our brain allows us to understand the future. Let's do an experiment. Talk to your dog tonight and explain to your dog the meaning of tomorrow. You can't do it. Animals do not understand tomorrow. We do because we have a prefrontal cortex. The front part of our brain, that's what it does. It simulates planning, scheming, uh, creating uh, programs in the front of the brain. That's what we do. We plan all the time. We're obsessed with time. Animals are not. Animals live in the present. 
And so you, um, but but then you make you you make the um, the leap, which I find very interesting. That if there is some other extraterrestrial civilization out there that is millions of years advanced, then they too must have started from some point of weakness. Uh, and I thought that was a very interesting leap, like that they probably didn't start from strength. They probably start like like you make the point. The lion doesn't really have to improve. It already can eat and do whatever it wants. It's the king of the jungle. We had to improve. So we 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 almost evolved not these individual things, but we also involve this ability to improve. And, That's right. And, and that must be true. Your your idea is that must be true of other civilizations that 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 succeed beyond their limited planets. Right. We only have three things going for us. One is we have stereo eyesight, the eyesight of a hunter. We have a thumb, an opposable thumb, uh, or a claw or a tentacle. And then we have language. Now ask yourself a simple question. How many animals in the entire world have all three? Stereo eyes, the eyes of a predator, because predators are smarter than prey. Fingers or thumbs, something to grab instruments, and language. And you realize we're the only game in town. I mean, the apes come close but their language is limited to maybe 50 words maximum. Uh, a child can understand already uh, about two or 3,000 words. And so that's what makes us different. In outer space, we expect aliens to have those three characteristics in whatever order, in whatever shape, a claw, a tentacle, more than one eye, whatever. But those three ingredients uh, had to be coordinated, and that's what the brain does, to coordinate those three things. And, and, and again... Um... It must come from a point of weakness because we needed the brain to overcome all of the thousands of weaknesses we had versus other species. That's right. We foresee the future. That's what animals cannot. Uh, animals have a very poor sense of memory. Animals do not remember things very well. They certainly don't plan for the future. Animals, for example, when they hibernate, it's just a question of reacting to the weather. It's automatic. They don't say, I'm going to hibernate tomorrow. I got to pack my bags and get going. No, animals don't plan at all. And that's what separates us from the animals. Well, and it's interesting too, because this idea that weakness could lead to almost infinite strength sort of applies to every area of life in some ways. That's right. If you look at evolution, right? Animals try to have every single advantage they can over other animals. And so most of the niches have been taken. The strongest, the fastest, the, the ones that swim the best. All the niches have been taken except for one. And that's where we come in. We are, quote, the smartest. We are the ones who plan. And we have stereo eyesight. Uh, we have an opposable thumb. And we have language to to carry out the wishes of the living brain. That's what makes us separate. So when we encounter aliens from out of space, they're not going to look like blobs. They're not going to look like some kind of a freaky thing from the oceans. No, they're going to have some kind of hand or tool to manipulate the environment, some kind of sensing thing like an eye and a language. And that's the bottom line. Anything else, anything else can go. Do you think they, do you think they will have a language at that at point? Let's say, let's say some... You know, you refer to the Kardashev scale of uh, type one, type two, type three civilizations, and possibly a type four. Uh, do you think a type three, a, a civilization that can harness the power of a galaxy, do you think they will need a language at that point, or do you think they'll be just all merged like into some, you know, giant consciousness that that doesn't require a language? Well, I think even when we enter a type one civilization, that is a planetary civilization, a civilization like you see in, in Buck Rogers or, or in uh, Flash Gordon, even when we enter a, a type one civilization, we'll already have a planetary civilization where we will communicate mentally. That is, we can already access the mind using computers. Uh, we recorded the first memory in animals just two years ago. We can download memories from animals. Next, we're doing it on primates. And then we're doing it on Alzheimer's patients so that Alzheimer's patients will push a button and memories will come flooding into their mind. So we'll communicate by what I call brain net. Instead of the internet of digits, we'll simply mentally, telepathically communicate with other people. It seems like, so, so like you're saying, this is, partially almost possible already. I right. guess they've you could map out what neurons are firing in the brain based on what you're thinking or feeling. Right. And then if you, a new person, starts firing those neurons, it could be matched against a database of 
firings that we already know about, and then we know what you're thinking or feeling. Right. Look at my colleague, Stephen Hawking, right? He's lost control of his fingers. Uh, he cannot talk anymore. He can barely blink. So how does he communicate? Next time you see him on television, look at his right frame of his glass. There's a chip in his glasses called eye brain. It's a radio receiver picks up his brain waves and then sends the brain waves to a laptop computer and then types. So by thinking, simply by thinking telepathically, he can type on a, on a laptop computer. That's how he communicates with the world now. In the future, we may have that option. Uh, teenagers will love it because instead of putting happy faces at the end of every sentence, they'll simply put the emotion of their senior prom, their first kiss, their first date, or whatever. Kids will go crazy over this once we put emotions on the internet. I like how, you know, and you, you mentioned this, it's not, it, you never forget the role of entertainment, even in um, interstellar travel. <laughs> like, we're going to need to entertain ourselves if we're going for, for hundreds of years to some other planet. Um, but so what fascinated me was not so much the answers you provide again, but your ability to ask questions across all of these different categories. And asking questions seems more science than coming up with solutions. Even Einstein was said to just be asking questions out loud. So how would you describe science in general? Well, I'm a physicist, so we believe in looking at things that are within the laws of physics. Uh, we reject things that obviously violate the laws of physics, like the conservation of matter and energy. But laser pointing that you mentioned is an idea that I had. Why do we need flying saucers? Why do we need UFOs to go between stars? No, I think in the future, in fact, even for humans, we'll digitize ourselves. There's already a Silicon Valley company which will digitize everything known about you on the internet. And in the future, when you go to the library, instead of taking a book out about Winston Churchill, you'll talk to Winston Churchill. You'll talk to a holographic image that is digitized. Everything known about Winston Churchill will be part of that hologram. I would love the opportunity to talk to Einstein. I'd love the opportunity to sit down with Einstein, have a conversation with him about relativity and the quantum theory. So once we digitize ourselves, perhaps we can put it on a laser beam and shoot it to the moon. One second, you're on the moon. No booster rockets, no weightlessness problems, no accidents. In 20 minutes, uh, you're on, on Mars. So would that, it wouldn't really be you. It would be sort of like this uh, digital clone of you, this, this, this electron clone of you. Well, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it all depends on how you define you. If you are biological, then you're right. It's a tape recorder you're talking to. But if you is the sum total of all the information known about you, your emotions, your neural networks, your brain pathways, everything known about you, then it is indistinguishable. You're talking to something which will be indistinguishable from you. Now, let me stick my neck out. I think this already exists. I think aliens from outer space have done away with flying saucers thousands of years ago. Or millions of years ago. Or millions of years ago. And they simply laser port themselves across the galaxy. There could be a laser highway right next to the Earth with billions of souls laser pointing themselves across the Milky Way galaxy. And we are too stupid to even know of its existence. That's how primitive we are compared to a civilization that can laser port themselves across the galaxy. But like I said, it's well within the laws of physics. We should be able to do it within maybe 100 years once we have the Connectome project finished, which is to map the entire human brain, possibly by the end of the century. So I want to I want to get back to this particularly in the term in in terms of anti-aging because uh, when you talk about the future of humanity in this book, a lot of it is related to, you know, are we limited by the 80 to 100 year lifespan that most people think we are? But do you think this is happening? Do you think this is the way, uh, if there's aliens or if we eventually do interstellar travel, do you think that's the way we'll do it? Uh, I think so. The distances are so great that it would take 70,000 years for a conventional rocket to reach the nearby stars. So either we undergo suspended animation or we lengthen the human lifespan. Now, let me stick my neck out again. I think that our grandkids may have the option of hitting the age of 30 and stopping, just stopping the aging process and living for many decades at the age of 30. We are not beginning to understand the genetics behind the aging process. Like, what is aging? Aging is the accumulation of 
error. That's all aging is. The accumulation of genetic error, molecular error, error buildup every time a cell divides. But we have error correcting mechanisms. We can fix those errors. Think of a car. Where does aging take place in a car? Well, the engine. Why? That's where you have moving parts and that's where you have combustion. Well, where in the cell do you have the powerhouse of the cell? The mitochondria. Bingo! We now know where aging takes place in a cell. Now, if we had air correcting mechanisms in the mitochondria, then we'll be as good as new. So, in fact, in Menlo Park, California, we can even immortalize cells now. That verb did not exist in the English language until recently, to immortalize. But skin cells divide 60 times, grow old, and die. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we die because there's a clock in every skin cell. 60 times you divide, and then you go into senescence. Now we can stop the clock. Using something called telomerase, you can actually stop the clock. Uh, at Miller Park, they have cells now that have divided thousands of times. Now, there's also a catch here. There's always a catch someplace, right? The catch is that cancer cells also use telomerase, because cancer cells are immortal. That's why they kill you. They keep on dividing until they form a tumor, which kills you. So we have to control telomerase. A Nobel Prize was recently given to the doctors who are analyzing the properties of telomerase, which is nothing but one of several chemicals and enzymes that we're looking at that seem to regulate aging. So uh, given that, uh, so, so the idea is every time a cell divides, uh, these telomerase, or however you say it, uh, get a little smaller. Telomeres, right. Yeah, until they get so small they can't hold the cells together, That's I guess. That's right. And, and so, then it dies. And with cancer cells, they they don't get smaller. They just replenish themselves and just keep on dividing forever, and that's why they kill you. Is it possible to sort of get, let's say, a benign cancer where just every few years you get the benign tumor cut out and then you just keep on going? Like, just replace all of your cells with these like some kind of benign cancer cells where you know where the, they're very specifically, you know they're only going to create one big tumor and you just kind of cut out all the tumors every few years. Uh, well, in principle, yeah. I, it turns out that benign tumors versus malignant tumors, what's the difference? Uh, th the only difference is that malignant tumors just keep on growing and, and they're unstoppable. And that's what we want to do with uh, our immune system. We want to augment our immune system so that we can zap these cancer cells, which keep on keep keep on growing, and now we have something called immunotherapy, which actually zeroes in on cancers which simply reproduce, and immunotherapy allows you to kill them. So that's a new big thing that just just within the last five years, we've had a new way of attacking cancer. By the way, I think the way to eliminate cancer is to put a chip in your toilet, so that your toilet becomes intelligent and will analyze your bodily fluids for cancer genes and cancer enzymes maybe 10 years before a tumor forms. So the word tumor, I think, will eventually disappear from the English language because your toilet will become intelligent. So, so uh, again, in terms of the anti-aging, you, you talk about all sorts of things. Um, what's another potential way we're going to... Well, take a look at animals. You know, the Greenland shark lives to 400 years of age. You mentioned now, one that has even 572 years old. That's right. Now, you may say to yourself, well, that's just folklore, legend, hearsay. No, it turns out that the eyeball of the Greenland shark adds a layer every year, like a tree ring. And you simply count the layers in the eyeball, and bingo, you now know that the Greenland shark, for all intents and purposes, is immortal. So, we have similar genes to the Greenland shark. Also, did you know that elephants almost never get cancer? By rights, elephants should get lots of cancer because they're big, lots of tissue, lots of tissues uh, reproducing themselves. But no, uh, elephants very rarely get cancer because they have an extra P53 gene. P53 allows you to protect yourself against cancer. It turns out that elephants have much more copies uh, P53 than the human. So we're now beginning to understand the genetics of why some animals live to be two years of age and die like mice and elephants, which seem to be impervious to cancer. The genetics is the key. So how come we can't just inject ourselves with a bunch of 
P53? Well, I tell you, there are fattest, food fattest out there that will inject themselves with almost anything they can get their hands on. But so far, we have not found anything that's reproducible. The only thing which actually works in the laboratory every single time is caloric restriction. That is starving to death an animal. They live longer. You eat 30% less calories and you live 30% longer. Uh, this is reproducible in mice, in spiders, in worms, in dogs, cats, now primates. It turns out that every, every species we looked at obeys this rule, except for humans. Why? Because we bellyache too much. We sue the people if we're inconvenienced in a scientific trial. So we've never tested it on humans, but every, every species we've tested it on, it seems to work. So you suspect it'll work in humans? I suspect it'll work in humans too, but like I said, we bellyache too much. Do you do, you do it? Uh, no, uh, because I don't want to be a guinea pig. However, there are scientists who do this on themselves. In fact, the New York Times just had an article where scientists will actually test many of these things on themselves because they want a head start on becoming immortal. And what's what's the result from these scientists? Uh, the result is negative. It turns out they they pretty much died at the same rate that most of us die. Sorry about that. <laughs> why, why, why do you think? Like, it probably should work. Are, you think they're, they're kind of cutting corners and snacking late at night? <laughs> well, I think ultimately the, there's going to be a cocktail, not just one magic bullet like telomerase or resveratrol or whatever, not just one, but a cocktail uh, may actually become a prototype for the fountain of youth. So I don't doubt that it exists because it doesn't violate the laws of physics. There's nothing in the laws of physics against immortality. Okay, Hard to believe, but it's true. So I think it may be possible. Like I said, I think our grandkids may be able to reap the fruits of a lot of this technology. Biogerontology was a science that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. And now Nobel Prizes are being given to discoveries in that field of biogerontology. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But 
people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. This ad is about AT&T's deal on the new iPhone 15 Pro, and it's real, guaranteed. That's not always the case with other ads. The view of a lifetime. Only with a pricey upgrade. Breathe in to find inner peace. Then pay extra to remove the ads. At AT&T, we mean what we say. Learn how to get iPhone 15 Pro with titanium on us with eligible trade-in. Guaranteed. Connecting changes everything. AT&T. <laughs> See att.com slash iPhone for details about the guaranteed trade-in promo for new and existing customers. Available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. So, like, what do you do personally to keep healthy, live longer, keep mentally active? You're, you're in your 70s. You're obviously, you know, the smartest person on the planet. So, what do you do? Uh, well, you know, there is a fountain of youth, and that is exercise and eat right. What your mother said was basically correct. Your mother said, get out of bed, get some fresh air, get some exercise, and don't eat so much ice cream. Well, I think your mother was onto something. Uh, that's called the paleo diet, the diet that we humans ate uh, tens of thousands of years ago. And uh, I think our body was fine-tuned to live in a paleolithic era of lots of exercise, eating fruits and berries, and eating lots of vegetables, and once in a while, eating meat. So I think there's some truth to the the paleo diet. So like, what did you eat this morning? Uh, I didn't. <laughs> okay, you you do not eat in the morning. Uh, no, I try to skip a meal once in a while to to keep the calories down. And and what will you eat for lunch? Uh, probably nothing. <laughs> what are you gonna eat for dinner? <laughs> uh, well, fruits, vegetables, a little bit of meat. Uh, you know that I think is the the ideal diet that our body is fine tuned for millions of years to, to eat. And uh, I think that's the way our ancestors ate. And I think that's the reason why we, we function the way we do. I call this the caveman principle or the cave women principle, that our personalities haven't changed much in 100,000 years. Uh, for example, take a look at the paperless office. Uh, we say that that was a prediction that never came true. We have more paper than before. And why is that? Because our ancestors were hunters. We want proof of the kill. We don't trust those electrons that disappear when you hit the off button. We want proof. And that's what paper is. And so I think we're still the cavemen and the cavewomen of old. That's why we have cities. People predicted that cities would empty out with all teleconference. 
No more cities anymore. No more commuting. We'll all just sit in front of a TV screen. No, we're hunters. We hunt in social groups. We want, we like the social interaction and the cohesion of the tribe, and that's why we have cities. That's why we have um, uh, offices of maybe a hundred people, which is the canonical number for Homo sapiens, about a hundred. For apes and gorillas, by the way, it's about uh, forty to fifty. So ape tribes are much smaller than human tribes. And that's the size of your Christmas card list. You send Christmas cards to about 100 people. That's the canonical number that your brain can digest and assimilate. Do you think, and, do you think also the fact that it's, um, that I, I read this one where that only about 10% of communication is verbal. The rest is sort of like, you know, in the, in the social dynamic of two people meeting. And so in order to have like full communication, you need to be in the same place as another person. Well, just realize that body language is older than language. Uh, language is relatively recent on a, on a genetic scale. And animals, of course, communicate using body language, grunts and groans and things like that. And so, yeah, uh, most of communication, I think, takes place non-verbally. But the fact that we do have the left part of the brain that governs language means that we can record uh, ideas for the next generation and for friends. Animals can't do that. Animals do not pass down information generation to generation. We do. So that helped us to evolve into, into Homo sapiens. But I think that, yeah, body language is the way most people communicate when they first bump into each other. Um, when men, men get together, they immediately size up each other on the basis of power, on the basis of strength. A social hierarchy develops very quickly when you put men together. When you put women together, it's a question of alliances. Uh, who's my best friend? Who can I trust today? Uh, who, who's my, my circle? Uh, so men and women have a different way. Just when they meet each other, it's partly genetically hardwired in the brain. How many people do you think, uh, and I know this is a little off topic, but how many people do you think is sort of the ideal number of people to be close with? Uh, well, um, anthropologists say 100 is the canonical number that yeah, we're that, used to because that to, was the to tribe. Bond with, to, to, be, to be to hunt with, but like to actually be close with and, and really share secrets with, say. Oh, that probably gets down to just a handful because you're not talking about the family unit. So there are two basic units for the human body, uh, for the human society. One is the family unit of just a handful of people. And the other one is about 100, which was the size of a tribe for most of human existence. For hundreds of thousands of years, 100 was about the canonical size. Anything larger, the group was split apart into two tribes because it was not enough food for everybody. So uh, tribes would grow till about 100 people. And then they would split apart into two tribes. And then, of course, years later, they would war with each other for limited resources. But 100 is about the canonical size for Homo sapiens. Different animals have different sizes. Uh, as I mentioned, apes, it's around 40 to 50. Uh, with other kinds of chimpanzees and things, it's smaller. But you can actually rank uh, primates on the basis of the size of their tribe. Hmm. So I want to um, also get back to uh, faster than light travel now. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to go all over the place here. Yeah. From your diet to faster than light travel. So. You talk about this sort of, um, you know, light porting, but that's still speed of light travel. That's and it right. seems like if there's uh, going to be every opportunity to really explore the galaxy, you need to go faster than the speed of light. Or or you need to have the, the patience of millions of years, which potentially you could do with light porting. But uh, I just want to throw, I just want to ask you about things I know nothing about. <laughs> and you, you, you touch upon them. In, in the book, but I, don't, I feel like uh, I want to ask more because I, I don't fully understand. So for fast and light travel, given that Einstein talks about how, you know, time can, um, you know, space and time can, can warp and bend, is it possible maybe to do fast and light travel taking advantage of that bending? Yes. Uh, first of all, let's go back to Shakespeare. Shakespeare of course, once said that the world... Why did I start there? <laughs> yeah, the world is a stage, said Shakespeare, and we're actors and actresses who make our entrances and exits. That's the picture of Isaac Newton, that the universe is a stage, it's inert, and we're just nothing but actors uh, uh, walking on the stage of life. Along comes Einstein, who says, no, the stage is warped, it's curved. So when you walk across the stage of Shakespeare, you think that there's a force pushing you to the left, pushing you to the right. There's no force at all. It says that the stage is warped. Now we have string theory, which allows trap doors. 
trap doors in the stage of life so that you disappear at one point and reappear someplace else faster than the speed of light. Now, to be fair, the first person to introduce what are called wormholes or gateways is Einstein. 1935, he wrote a paper with Nathan Rosen, his student, and he introduced the Einstein-Rosen Bridge, which is a bridge that connects two universes. So take, take two sheets of paper that are parallel to each other, take a pencil and just punch a hole connecting these two sheets of paper, and that pencil is the wormhole. Well, why should that exist? Uh, because it is a solution of Einstein's equation, and we think that black holes may, just may, have a wormhole at the center. If you take Einstein's equations for a spinning black hole, not a stationary one, but a spinning black hole, it collapses to a ring, not a dot. The ring rotates very fast, and if you fall through the center of the ring, you wind up in a parallel universe. So that the rim of the looking glass of Alice is the black hole. So, so I, I have a couple of questions on this, and you, you refer to this concept and I always love how you bring in pop culture into your books. You refer to this concept when discussing the movie Interstellar, which was just a fascinating discussion in, in the book. Um, one, the first question is, you know, if you combine Einstein's theories on black holes with quantum mechanics, part of your point is that, you know, a black hole is sort of defined by this fixed singularity in the center. But according to quantum mechanics, you can't fully measure any tiny, tiny particle like a singularity. So that suggests almost a contradiction. Is that related to the possible wormhole concept? Yeah, exactly. You see, every uh, textbook about black holes says that the black hole is a dot called a singularity. Well, that's wrong. That's obviously wrong because it violates the quantum principle. A dot, you know exactly where a dot is. According to the uncertainty principle, you cannot know anything with absolute certainty. So therefore, at the center of a black hole, you cannot have a dot. In fact, Einstein's equations give you a ring, a fuzzy ring, and it allows the possibility of going through the ring to the other side of the universe. Now, in the movie Interstellar, that was a movie not done with Hollywood special effects. That movie was done with a computer, a computer which actually took Einstein's equations and they sent a rocket ship through Einstein's equations. So a Nobel Prize uh, laureate, uh, Kip Thorne, helped to, was the advisor for that, that film. In fact, at the end of the film, when Matthew McCona McConaughey is floating in this weird contraption of many mirrors and, and uh, many cubes, uh, that's string theory. The movie actually ends in hyperspace. He, he actually mo lives in the fifth dimension at the end of the movie. So is um, uh, uh, okay. So I'm, I'm gonna, so related to this. This is one idea you didn't mention in the book, but I'm curious about it. Uh, this idea of quantum entanglement. So the, the the contradiction that if I send a particle off in to my left and a particle off to my right, and they're identical in every way, then when I measure millions of years from now, the particle on the right, it should be instantly that that measurement changes the particle according to quantum theory, and it also should automatically change the measurement of the other particle faster than the speed of light. So given that that uh, can happen faster than the speed of light, is there a chance there could be uh, faster than light travel using that idea? Well, the short answer is no, but it's intriguing because it was Einstein himself. No, I thought I was going to win a Nobel Prize here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it was Einstein himself who envisioned exactly what you said. I have two electrons vibrating in unison together, vibrating in unison up and down, up and down together. I separate them and then an umbilical cord. An umbilical cord then extends between one and the other, such that if you jiggle one, then the other, in some sense, senses the fact that its partner has been jiggled, and that information travels faster than the speed of light. This has been measured in the laboratory. This is no longer science fiction. Einstein was wrong in that question. But ultimately, Einstein has the last laugh. Because Einstein said, well, obviously this violates relativity. Well, yes, it does violate relativity, but in a very special way. The information that goes faster than the speed of light is random information. It is unusable. So it's no good. You can't send Morse code using the EPR experiment. Why is it random in the sense that this particle, the, the second particle that we just say just changed is 
the, the change itself is random from the change that happens here? Uh, yeah, I think of putting on your socks in the morning. Let's say you have a, a green sock and you have a red sock, and you only have one red, one green. If you raise one pants and it's green, how fast did you know that the other sock was red? infinitely fast. You knew faster than the speed of light that the other sock was the other color. But can you send Morse code this way? No, you cannot send Morse code by changing socks on your feet. And so Einstein had the last laugh. So technically speaking, he was wrong. Something did go faster than light, but it's unusable. It's not measurable. It's not, you cannot send Morse code. Information cannot be sent this way. So, ha, Star Trek was wrong. Star Trek has what is called subspace communicators, where you communicate with Starfleet Command instantly across the galaxy. Nope, sorry about that. Unless, unless you're using some wormholes through a wormhole. Right. Now, right. now, that is a way that is compatible with Einstein's equations to warp space time itself and drill a hole in space. So, so, so I'm still trying to understand. Uh, like the like the way you explain quantum mechanics here was was fascinating to me. It made me think of things I never thought of before. So, for instance, we think of space as mostly nothingness, but you point out that then we're measuring something, and so that in quantum mechanics, that's impossible because once you measure something, it changes. So nothing must change. And then you point out maybe this is why there's just random atoms and elements appearing and disappearing in the midst of space, and 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 so on. Uh, and, and you refer a little bit to, to tachyons and, and so on. Where are these atoms going to back and forth from? Is that faster than light travel? Uh, well, it turns out that the vacuum is a lot more sophisticated than we thought. You see, nothing violates the quantum principle because <laughs> quantum mechanics says nothing is absolutely measurable, even nothingness itself. So a vacuum must be teeming, teeming with activity, and these are called virtual particles. And that's where the word virtual comes from in virtual reality. They stole it from physics. So virtual particles are particles that shouldn't exist but because of the quantum principle, there's a finite probability that they'll jump out of the vacuum and then jump back into the vacuum. Now, these are called quantum fluctuations. We think that that is how the universe was created. The universe itself may have been a quantum fluctuation in nothing. For example, what is the charge of the universe? Zero, because positive charges cancel negative charges exactly so the universe has zero charge. What is the spin of the universe? Well, galaxies spin in all directions like a top, but they average out to zero. What is the energy of the universe? Zero, because gravity has negative energy, matter has positive energy, and the two cancel each other out exactly. So in other words, somewhat similar to what the Bible says, the universe came out of nothing because of quantum mechanics, because even nothingness is chock full of activity out pops out our universe. Most universes, by the way, go back into the vacuum and never are never to be seen again. Our universe was different. Our universe jumped out of the vacuum and just kept on going, and here we are. And, and, and given kind of this, let's say, a theory of large numbers, your, your, uh, your premise a little bit is that outside of the universe created by this Big Bang, there must be other nothings where universes have popped out. That's right. In other words, Einstein said the universe is a bubble of some sort. We live on the skin of the bubble. The bubble is expanding. That's called the Big Bang Theory. However, string theory says there are other bubbles out there in a multiverse of universes. And when these bubbles bump into each other, that's called the Big Bang. Or when they peel off baby universes. And so some people say, well, what happened before the Big Bang? Well, if string theory is right, we know the answer that there were other universes that constantly bump into each other like a bubble bath. So the new paradigm that is sweeping physics, you can go to any physics conference and there'll be papers on this subject, is that the universe is one member of a multiverse of universes. And then, of course, people ask me the, the next question, is Elvis Presley still alive in another universe? Well, you can't rule it out. There's a finite probability that Elvis Presley is still alive in another universe. That that basically another universe created that was exactly the same as ours until Except some it point. deviated because it fissioned off, peeled off in a different direction. The river of time is a river which can fork, fork into two rivers. In one universe, Elvis Presley did not take drugs. In the other universe, he did. 
And so it's a quantum mechanical split of the universe. So yeah, he could still be alive, but not in this universe. Well, one theory that you that has been talked about a lot, but you don't specifically mention in this book, is the idea that, okay, this civilization, as meager as we are, is on the verge of creating you know, virtual realities where you put on a helmet and you're in a reality that seems almost as real as the reality that we exist in. Now, it's not quite there yet, but let's say in 20, 50, 100 years, when you put on a helmet, you can't even tell the difference between the reality of the helmet and the real reality. Now, given that, um, again, there might be advanced civilizations and probably are advanced civilizations millions and millions of years older than us, how come, you know, there's this theory that we probably aren't in one of their virtual realities because they've created so many and they were so good at it. Why aren't we just inhabitants of one of those virtual realities as opposed to in the so-called real reality? Yeah, ever since people saw the movie The Matrix, uh, people have been haunted by the idea that maybe reality is nothing but God hitting the play button on a video game. So here we are thinking that we have free will, but actually somebody just hit the play button and here we are dancing around thinking we have free will, but actually we're simply carrying out the digits in some kind of cosmic CD machine. Or maybe we do have free will. Maybe we were light ported into some virtual reality. Well, uh, first of all, you have to distinguish between real virtual reality and versus the appearance of virtual reality. Uh, first of all, if I were to simulate the weather, Let's start with something simple, like simulating the weather. What is the smallest object that can simulate the weather? Well, the weather consists of so many atoms that no computer on the Earth can possibly simulate the, the atmosphere in a simple box. So the smallest object that can simulate the weather is the weather. So we say that if the smallest object that can simulate something is that something itself, then we say you cannot simulate it. So yeah, the smallest object which can simulate the weather is the weather itself. Now, quantum mechanics makes it worse because atoms are no longer billiard balls. They can exist in multiple states simultaneously. That's why we have transistors. That's why we have laser beams. Why are transistors and lasers so bizarre? Because electrons can exist in multiple space, states at the same time, two places at the same time, violating what we call common sense, okay? And so because of that fact, it makes it much more difficult to simulate the weather. The weather is not quantum mechanical. And as a consequence, I think it is far beyond any computer to be able to simulate the weather. So sorry about that. I think we do not live in the matrix. So do you think the weather is more complicated than our brains? Uh, yeah, I think so, because our brain has about 100 billion neurons in it. And uh, that's the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, for example. But uh, just a, a, a quart of air, a quart of air contains many, many, many more atoms than, than 100 billion. So I think that even simply modeling the weather is more complicated than modeling the brain. So, so I, and I know I keep jumping from topics to topics, but there's so many topics in this book that, that are jumping off points. You mentioned... Um, you know, you talk a lot about gravity and, and of course the forces of gravity is what prevents us and to some extent. It, it keeps us alive, but it's also what prevents us from traveling across space and time. Right. And then, but you also mentioned how there's matter, antimatter, there's energy, negative energy, dark energy. There's all these different types of anti whatever we think is the real thing. So if, if we were to sort of isolate anti-gravity, wouldn't, and, and, Again, I don't know my physics in this, but wouldn't that be a force powerful enough to potentially go faster than the speed of light? Well, there is no such thing as anti-gravity in the sense of antimatter. Antimatter has the opposite charge of ordinary matter. Now, we learn in school that the electron has negative charge. Why can't it have positive charge? When it has positive charge, it is antimatter, the anti-electron. Now, antimatter does exist. In fact, like I said, when I was in high school, I, I, I played with antimatter, took photographs of it, and went to the National Science Fair with it. So antimatter does exist. However, anti-gravity probably does not. If you look at the Even though there are like gravitons and we've isolated that there are that there are gravity waves or gravitons somehow that exist. Well, gravity waves were identified and that won the Nobel Prize for for uh, three physicists, the discovery of gravity waves. Now the graviton has never been discovered, okay? Now, what is, what is the difference between these things? First of all, light consists of particles called photons. A quantum of light is the photon. 
And every time I watch Star Trek and Captain Kirk turns on the photon torpedoes, I laugh because a photon torpedo is a flashlight. So there is Captain Kirk turning on his flashlight. Now, a particle of gravity is called the graviton, and we have never seen it. Now, gravity waves do exist. They were predicted by Einstein back in 1916. So we know that gravity waves exist. We've now detected them, and we've given a Nobel Prize to three physicists for that fact. But gravity waves consist of trillions upon trillions of gravitons, and we have not yet seen any gravitons. Now, what is anti-light? It turns out that anti-light is light itself. The photon is its own antiparticle. The same thing for the graviton. The graviton, which we haven't seen in the laboratory yet, is its own antiparticle. So sorry about that. You're not going to get anti-gravity. So in outer, space, I'm missing. in outer space, if you see our astronauts uh, with gravity in outer space, it's because they spin the spacecraft. That's the only way to create an artificial gravity in outer space is to spin the spacecraft. That we can do, but it's very expensive, so we don't do it. So I do want to close in a second by asking, like, uh, not just how do you come up with solutions or possibilities, how do you come up with all the questions you come up with? Like maybe maybe you've been doing this for so long, you're not really aware of the process in your brain, but it's very different from, from most people's. Your book is filled with more questions than solutions. Well, you know, when I watch science fiction movies, I say to myself, what in this movie violated the laws of physics? When I see Harry Potter, in fact, that's, of course, a magic uh, uh, movie about magic, but I realize that, well, very few laws of physics are violated, even in Harry Potter. Once we understand the motion of molecules that can manipulate molecules, we can do things that most people would consider magic. And so, writing this book, I ask the same question. What prevents us from laser pointing? What prevents us from living nearly forever? What prevents us from going to the stars? And then I realize almost nothing. The laws of physics are compatible with everything inside that book. And then every time you come up with a solution, though, it seems like you're looking at, well, what questions does this lead to? Like, for instance, if, if we solve this pre uh, problem of anti-aging, of the cancers, you know, may, may, of the cells dividing instead of 60 times, 1,000 times, well, then uh, what do we do about the resulting cancers that could result? So it seems like every solution, you, you try to push yourself a little further than the solution and say, well, what 10 problems might occur here? Right. In other words... Um, like when, you push yourself. Uh, right. Because, you see, people have... Science fiction writers have explored many of these avenues, but they haven't looked at the consequences and the physics and the principles that may or may not make this uh, possible. Now, when I wrote the book Physics of the Impossible, I said that, well, there are three categories of impossibility. Some things are just unlikely, but well within the laws of physics, like starships, for example. Unlikely, but compatible with the laws of physics. Then things are at the borderline where they just may be possible and may not be possible, like time travel. That's at the real cutting edge of what we know about the quantum theory. Then there are things which are just impossible. <laughs> that is, uh, uh, um, Things that are impossible, like violating the conservation of matter and energy. That simply violates everything we know about the universe. So, when you put it that way, you begin to realize that every proposition in science fiction, you can pick apart. Is it simply plausible? Is it possible but unlikely? Or is it simply impossible? So, when you look at it that way, then you realize that there are gradations that you, every question has another answer, which begs more questions. But that's good, because that's what science is all about. All right, well, Michio Kaku, author of The Future of Humanity, uh, and I'll say the subtitle, Terraforming Mars, Interstellar Travel, Immortality, and Our Destiny Beyond Earth. Although, to be honest, I think this is about far much more than these topics. I really think this is about the, looking at a problem and the process of asking hundreds or even thousands of questions and exploring all sorts of fascinating things about the human species and our potential. Um, it's a great book. I, I, it's one of the most interesting books I've read this year. And uh, uh, thanks so much for coming on the, the podcast. I really appreciate it. Oh. And, and for anybody listening to this, uh, we have many great podcasts coming up uh, and podcast guests. Uh, 
subscribe to the James Altucher Show on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever it is you find your podcasts. And uh, once again, thanks, Michio, for, for coming on. That's right. And the website is mkaku.org, M-K-A-K-U.org, if you want to know more about the book, my schedule, the tour schedule, and things like that. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, so much fun. So interesting. Yeah, my attitude is, if it ain't fun, don't do it. I, I, I like that. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I have it's got to be fun. If I have it's, it has to be two out of three. If it isn't, if it doesn't teach you, if it's not fun, or if it's not financially worthwhile, oh. <laughs> it has to be two out of the three. Then, 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 then do it. What is it going to have to be financially uh, viable? Yeah. It has to be fun. And yeah. we'll, you have to learn something, I'll have learn fun, something. or financially worthwhile. It has to be two right. out of those three. Right. right. But I think the most important is it's got to be fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. I created this idea called Generation W. It's all about educating, inspiring, connecting women. And it's about building community at the same time. It's not like women are on some outpost somewhere, right? Just like you no know, ethnic people are some outpost there, people of color, right? We're all together. So if we learn how to appreciate each other, we elevate one and we elevate us all. And so for the first year, we just, that's where we started. And we had 700 people show up. They had no idea what they were showing up to, but they loved it. And they said, we want more. 